Welcome to the Wild Ones Podcast. We're your hosts, Jimmy and Francis, and we're going to talk about bike stuff. What have you been up to this week? I've been doing lots of DIY. Well, actually, I haven't been doing lots of it. I've been doing a little bit of DIY. Oh, you seem very refreshed after your holiday. Um, yeah, I guess I am. Like you've been smiling. I know. It's, well, no, I do smile after a coffee. <laughs> Only after drugs. We don't call coffee drugs, though, do we? I thought we did. That's what we talked about last week. Did did we? I don't remember last week. <laughs> I must have been tired. You need another coffee. What have you been up to? Um, it's just playing Zelda again. Oh, I got a uh, Xenomorph tattoo. Nice. Mm. Got rained on the other day on the bike. Fine. Uneventful week, really. <laughs> but it's I've, been fantastic. Nice break. I've following some conversations that we've had. I've been playing Assassin's Creed quite a bit. Mm-hmm. Um, what? Well, which which one is it? What's well, my called? suggestion? Origins. Origins. Yeah. Yep. That's that is definitely that's the Egypt one, isn't it? Yeah. 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 And like I'm level twenty five currently and I'm and I'm still in the area where it's like seventeen to twenty. So you're a you're a big man. I'm like properly like cl- I've done every single side quest. Oh, completion. Like so you know, like you can do you can do the map where you like select and complete things. Yeah. The only stuff on there is like the, the fast travel places. You should definitely not buy Zelda. Okay. Because you'd never come into work. <laughs> So I should definitely buy the album. Your life, (laughs) (laughs) right? Let's get into the debrief. Someone brought a hypnosis chamber to the Tour de France fan. Avec Swift. Are you you sure? Avec Swift. Do we have to say Avec Swift at the end? They've paid a lot of money for that. They have. have. Are you sure that hypnosis isn't a typo? No, hi- hypnosis. Are you sure? Yes, definitely. Yes, hundred percent not a typo. Well, reading into it, it's more like. Like hydrotherapy. No, it's a lit, but uh, the, the term they've used is hypnosis from this company. So Cycling Weekly revealed that the FDJ team had a hypnosis chamber set up to help its riders get marginal gains in the race. It's basically a portable white cabin with a chair thing inside it to help relax their minds post-race. It was seen parked in the forecourt of FDJ, uh, the FDJ team hotel throughout the race. <laughs> The pictures of it, it's, it's not as cool as I thought it would be. In my head, it was, you know, in The Simpsons, they go on one of those floating things. Oh, Crazy yeah. hallucinations. Yeah. Uh, like the weightless chamber where it's a bathtub. It's not as cool as that. No. But then you get all wet after the race and that'll be annoying. But the it's, yeah, it's like a white thing. It looks like a scanning device. It does look Sitting like, like a kind of... Have you seen a chair with a bit on the top? They refer to it as a zero gravity position. Mm. Well, that's the position. If you were in zero gravity, humans kind of go, don't they? But there is gravity. So there's the, <laughs> like a zero gravity position is surely like. I want to read the name of the company, position. but the picture is very small. Ryokan. Ryokan? No idea. Or Riken. I don't know. So the riders go into this cabin. And they lie in what they call a zero gravity position, chest and knees aligned at the same height, which allows the body to regulate your heartbeat naturally. They then follow the instructions. For the record, I think your body always regulates your heartbeat naturally. Pretty brief, yeah. They then follow the instructions given to them. This already sounds stressful. <laughs> I hate instructions. You know what we do with instructions? <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> You'd be stressed. Oh, I'm so stressed. <laughs> Even though I'm in this position. They then follow the instructions given to them. feel gravity. By an audio program. Oh, so they haven't got to read a manual. At least there's that. This is apparently used to reduce hyperactivity in the brain, brought on by things like stress. It's also meant to improve sleep and balance the autonomic nervous system, aiding recovery. They're apparently trialing it, and if the, res- if the race results are good, they'll roll it out at other points in the calendar. What are the race the re- results? The race results will be, clearly it will be because of this, not because they're good at cycling. What are, what are the race results? Oh, they're here. <laughs> uh, Cecil Utrup, Ludwig placed seventh in the GC, became fourth in the team ranking, FDJ, but they had zero stage wins. Okay, so good enough to roll it out to the rest. I think this is a cracking example of marketing crap. Yeah. However, I think what they're actually doing is meditating, relaxing the riders, which is good. Which is a good thing. Like that's, you can't argue with it. It, it, it. Yeah, there is. It's yeah, definite benefits to 
Meditation. But the hydro... What's the word? Hydrotherapy? No, hypnosis thing. <laughs> yeah, I don't know why I can think of that. That's the Simpsons thing. Yeah. <laughs> the hypnosis chamber just sounds like marketing crap to me. Mm. But meditation, in my opinion, is absolute gold dust. Yeah. And I can see how that would benefit. You know, like getting a good night's sleep is obviously very important to performance the next day. Yeah. So if you meditate and relax and unwind, not even ne- like in a less... It doesn't even ha- even necessarily need to be meditation in like the like um sense, but it could just be like being calm. What's your interpretation of meditation? Do you listen to you do Headspace? Yeah, head, I, I do Headspace an app for the uh, listeners at home. Yeah, there's loads of there's tons of apps out there now. I I always I actually signed up to the anxiety the anxiety UK charity and uh, a couple of years ago, and you got a free twelve month Headspace subscription. Well, it's technically mm-hmm. not free; you have to pay to join the charity. Um, and I've just had it ever since. Yeah. I, I get on with it really well. I think f- for me, the whole point of meditation is a space to learn calm, mm-hmm. but there's a million different ways of doing it. And I think that as a principle is what they're trying to tap into here with this hypnosis chamber is ultimately getting the riders in a state of calm. Cause I actually remember when I went and met up with Lou Gibson and all of the girls or women that were doing uh, riding the, the men's Tour de France a day before the men's, so the International mm-hmm. a couple of years ago, they were constantly getting like rubbish sleep. They were always in like in weird different places. And like one of the biggest issues with that was them just constantly being like knackered. Mm-hmm. So actually having a method, perhaps if they all did some kind of group on meditation, they'd be more calm and get a better night's sleep. It's a thing that other teams but, have done uh, similar things in the past to try and relax the riders. Like, do you remember Team Sky had these sponsored mattresses and they'd be like roll up mattresses so every single time they went to a hotel they wouldn't use the mattress there yeah. they'd roll out or maybe it was on top so they'd have a consistent mm-hmm. feeling bed yeah and like so pillows clever. like people have preferences with pillows mm-hmm. like that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, I have a special pill I think the concept probably is something that exists within marginal gains but I think the hypnosis chamber is just it's quite big as well and you can only have one person in it at a time. It's in a trailer. Did we mention that earlier? You, you probably, it's in like a... You probably have put two next to each other, like up. snuggling up. You can, and it becomes less restful. I don't know, maybe more. Depends who the people are. Mm, exactly, they could be cuddling. Yeah. Like when we were <laughs> travelling around the UK. <laughs> I don't remember cuddling. <laughs> oh, do you? I remember the beds being very close in a couple of the rooms, though. <laughs> Are we going... <laughs> <laughs> Uh, right, on to the next bit. Prize money at the Tours. Someone worked out that the 2023 Men's Tour de France winner was paid €146.08 Euros eight cents per kilometre, while the Women's Tour winner earned €52.03 Euros three cents per kilometre. The Men's winner, uh, Vingegaard, got €500,000, and Demi Vollering, in the women's race, got 50,000. It's a lot less. It is a lot less. What are your thoughts on that? <clears throat> I know why it's happening, because it's just classic capitalism. capitalism. Yeah. You know, like, the organisers pay money and want to make more money than they're paying to host the event, and therefore they want to pay as little as possible. But sure. they need to pay enough for it to happen. Mm-hmm. Like, that's ultimately why it's happening. It's one of these things that's just going to take ages. It's going to take years and years and years for them to slowly increase the amount that uh, the coverage will increase, therefore sponsorships will increase, and eventually it will be much more even, I hope. However, so many... You've got to admit, there's a lot... Like, the guys who sponsor men's cycling, historically, or all cycling... It's people who own big companies who have, is it like tax write-offs? But they're j- basically they're fans of the sport. They're not getting any benefits from sponsoring. As we have d- discussed in previous podcasts, we don't know what half of them are. Like you buying quick step floors because of that. Oh, I, I tell you what though. I tell you what I noticed when we were traveling around the UK, all of the hotels we stayed in had uh, Hans Grower Kitchen, uh, not kitchen. Oh, well, you want to go where they for one of those? And one of them was, maybe it does work. One of them was Premier Inn, which you said you believe the CEO is a mad a cycling fan. So maybe that's why he ended up doing it, and that would be worth millions. Yeah, okay, no, I would imagine. I'll be happily, you know. 
So, so, However, I feel like there's lots of people who uh, are into cycling who might be able to help this situation, particularly as it's, I know this is not small amounts of money to the individual, but it is small amounts of money to the companies who can potentially resolve this. So in terms of the prize money specifically, yeah, they could go, yeah, here's 450 more grand. That would speed up the process, wouldn't it? The more incentives, more... Women's football is such a good case study yeah. for why there is large amounts of value for businesses and brands to invest in a very much growing space. Like that, the... What's that... happened with that? Well, it's just, just astronomical now, isn't it? Like, the, Big. like when, when did you ever hear of a Women's World Cup? Like, you know, granted the last one we heard of, but like, it's, like, it's massive now. I don't know. I've, I've, I feel like for something to grow, it needs to be backed. Uh, and there definitely isn't the backing currently to give it the best chance of growth. Like we were saying in the podcast last time, the younger people in the Tour de France or in the men's Tour de France... Um, because there's been large salaries and lots of money in the space, they've been, you know, they've almost certainly been groomed from a young age because there's actually like potential. More so than the women's. Well, well yeah, well, ultimately fr from what you need to exist on in any sport, it doesn't even just mean like the women's version of a sport, something that's new. There has to be an ultimate goal available to someone like there has to be. Uh, a, a method or a reason to make a really significant sacrifice in your life to try and achieve something. And usually it's for a financial gain. Like, yes. Or at least sustainability is attractive. Well, yeah. It's like, yeah. this is a, a, An a actual job career, yeah. The, the, Whereas that is not, that, that has not been dangled in front of any women, like female cyclists. Exactly. So, so the space needs to grow enough mm. that it's a legitimate proposition for there to be a good, uh, what's what's the word for like um, development, like youth development, so that there, there's enough good talent coming through that makes it a comparable level. Yeah, for sure. And it, it is definitely happening. It is definitely happening. It is, it is, it is. It's just slow and frustrating. Yeah, and, and usually what you find in these kind of things is that it's less marginal and there's more anomalies. So you get people like, Mariam Voss, who's just like unbelievably good, and like Van Vluten, that like a, they're like bet they're significantly better than a large proportion of the field. It's kind of a, it's how it is at the moment in the men's tour, France. Yes, <laughs> which is which it shouldn't be. It's not always. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like once you get to margin, look at like like football for example. Like uh, again, again, so much you, bigger, right? it, exactly. Yeah. yeah, you the standard is like much more small there's much more much more marginal yep. which comes from it being like big and developed yep i'm surprised that there's still that much of a difference like five hundred thousand for the men's 10 times fifty thousand yeah. for the women's like yeah i didn't think i i assumed it was going to be like a lot closer than that mm -hmm. it's not yeah that's bad it is bad more doping news from the world of pro cycling this week pro Alex Bourdin was disqualified from the Giro d'Italia after testing positive for Tramadol. This is a retrospective disqualification. So this year's Giro. Uh, he was 22 years old, really young, rides for AG2R. Uh, he came 73rd in the Giro, but he's been retrospectively disqualified from the race after blood samples he provided on stage 17 were found to contain Tramadol. Tramadol is an opiate pain medication and has been banned in competition since March 2019. It's a pretty extreme drug that a lot of people were using back when I was racing because it was legal at the time. Um, Where's he getting it from? Well, you can get it prescribed for pain. Like, doctors use it. Obviously, there's some argument whether it was actually for pain. Uh, and then... I, I suppose that's why this is a disqualification and not a ban. Yeah, because it's not as serious as like, a, it's a pure doping substance. However, it is performance enhancing because you don't can't feel your legs, can you? What about paracetamol if he's, if he's got a headache? Yeah, <laughs> safer option if you're a pro. <laughs> <laughs> Ibuprofen yep. if, if, he, yeah, yep. if he's feeling a bit inflamed. Yeah, for sure. Um, I, I, I'm so frustrated 
I was so optimistic. You are very optimistic. But, Last podcast, you're very, uh, you want to believe. You want to believe. But it's not like, that doesn't, this, him getting, doing this. Firstly, it doesn't mean it's definitely malicious or trying to cheat. It does. You reckon? He knows it's illegal. Yeah. <laughs> so it's definitely like cheating. Definitely naughty. It doesn't mean everyone is. Maybe. Well, some, with someone <laughs> was definitely caught for it last year. There are, there are, uh, there are lots of people doing things right. There are lots of guys doing it right. I get speculation. Speculation, but that's that's that what I be speculation, but it is. Uh, yeah, true. true. Um, it's it is it is sad that someone that's twenty two years old is feels like they have to do one a drug that's illegal for the sport, mm -hmm. but also is literally an opioid. Like you know, that, that's essentially like as addictive as like heroin and you massively know, like, addictive. It's it's like a nasty thing for like really, really extreme pain stuff that he feels like he has to do to be a professional cyclist, mm -hmm. presumably. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that yeah, is yeah. a very sad thing. And so the thing that they, so I talked to Dr. Danny about this and <laughs> she gave me just a list of reasons why, so this is ER doctor we've spoken to. American. American ER, ER doctor, uh, A&E for English viewers. The they don't like prescribing. They would rather prescribe ketamine over tramadol in a lot of cases because not only is an opiate massively addictive, but it also acts on different receptors in your brain, so it can cause high blood pressure, low blood pressure, um, reactiveness is reduced. So for cycling, where, where, like tramadol, you talk about tramadol. That? We're talking yeah, about yeah. Um, kidney failure, breathing issues, and then finally addiction which is the same as, as most other opiates. There's even better opiates that they would rather choose rather than tramadol. Um, to put the addiction, in, the addiction part into perspective, um, I won't mention any names. However, there are people who I used to race with. Nick Vieri. <laughs> that was never a race. <laughs> no, no, I, was, I was trying to think of a silly name I could throw in. It would explain a lot. <laughs> um, who are, have quit racing years ago and still take tramadol now. Because they've become addicted to it. So it's it's, 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 uh, it's, it's not a, a thing you should be messing around with. Mm. Like it's serious stuff. Serious stuff. Um, I'm pretty certain. I, I've, I've said it at least once before as well. Oh, like OG Tour de France, they were definitely doing stuff like heroin. and Similar like sort of yeah, it, yeah. It's, it's the same principle, isn't it? It presumably numbs you up so hard Marco, yeah. that you can just, just keep... Keep going. Keep going when your body's saying like, no, I'm actually like a rope breaking. I have always like, you know, you get these things like uh, Garen, Garen Thomas a few times is like, Gary Thomas has broken a bone in his back and he's still doing the droid. And like, how? I think that's, um, I would, I, my brain doesn't go to, oh, he must be on painkillers or anything like that. Mine goes to adrenaline and finish. Like I've, I've had some crashes in races and been pretty gnarled up and you just carry on racing. And then it's only after the race where you go, oh, there's, I, yeah. I, so I crashed, I road rash on my right side here. The, we have, everyone has symmetrical road rash after a few years of racing in the same places. But uh, I took so much skin off the side of my leg. I don't grow leg hair anymore on the side of my leg. And apparently after speaking to doctors in years past, I should have had like a skin graft to repair that area because it was so many layers deep. But did that crash and jump back on the bike and finish the race and it did a stage race because the next day is you're just like oh you wake up coffee go and then the days afterwards like the week after i was barely able to walk that was really horrible so you can get pretty messed up and carry on what broken back okay yeah no it wasn't broken back it was just a little <laughs> it was a little boo-boo like, like well, Garen Thomas, ten, right? Ten Tour de it. France stages for the broken <laughs> back or whatever it was. Yeah. I remember George Hinkerby in that Chasing Legends film, he gets a big injury and he kind of carries on. I'm sure it's a collarbone. Finished the whole Tour de France with one collarbone. So, going back to Alex. Yeah. Young guy. Presumably. There was another young guy. Um, there was a dude. Um, I, I, again, I won't say his name, but this <laughs> is because I don't want to get it wrong and incriminate the wrong person. But there was a junior rider on the Catford team, which is a UK, the team Lawrence rode for, mm -hmm. our friend Lawrence Carpenter. And James Jobber. And James Jobber. Um, there was a, a junior on that team who was caught with EPO in a fridge and a training camp by like another kid's dad. At And he 
and it's under 18 you are to be a junior that's like people are doing some mad stuff yeah. that's all I'm saying that is so I buy this being a few years ago presumably Alex so the guy that we're talking about has been banned for life no because this is his first offence Bodart is free to continue racing a second offence would carry a penalty of a five-month ban, while a third would carry a nine-month ban. Nairo Quintana was stripped of sixth place at last year's Tour de France after twice testing positive for the painkiller. So I presume this is, like, it's levels of, of drugs. I'll be, I'll be happily corrected in the comments, but it's because it's a painkiller and could be, like, there's, there is argument, there can be argument, and there can be de debate over whether it's a legit painkiller. That has been misprescribed, and it's his mistake for I, choosing the wrong one on the banned substance list. I'm fairly confident, speculation however, mm -hmm. that it will be because the painkiller only lasts as, as long as the painkillers in your system. Whereas something like EPO has a long, a longer term benefit. Benefit, yeah. yeah, yeah. So it doesn't just benefit you in that, that exact moment. Mm -hmm. Whereas they know that once that Tramadol wore off 10 hours later or whatever it was, he's just the same rider again. Is that true? Because you could just write, you could do a, a more a insane training session because you're just like, I don't feel anything. And then well, that's the argument over what you, you, all the all the benefits you can historically, all that all the training sessions you've done and performed at that level. If you are doping and then you stop, you you're forever changed. You mm -hmm. forever created those cells. You're forever improved as an athlete. So does Tram Tramadol probably has that effect as well, doesn't it? Well, it means like all those, all the training you do while you're on it, or racing you do while you're on it, you can't feel your legs as much. It's got to be. How, like, do you, how do you know? Well, I'm guessing. Yeah, speculation. <laughs> <I'm back. laughs> speculation. I've never taken Tramadol. <laughs> we were talking last week about other sports and whether cycling gets a bad rap, has a reputation to repair, which I think it does. However, other sports have it too easy and that was uh, I've, I did a bit of research into a couple of other sports NFL in particular had a heated debate about the NFL and how much doping there is in the sport and I was convinced before even looking anything up that there was a lot of doping in the NFL and I was right 258 doping cases since 2001 and 58 of those were in the last five years they also have less strict regulations so they're allowed to have like cortisol, cortisol steroid injections on the side of the pitch i think there's something else similar in tennis as well they're allowed to inject things on the side whereas cycling is like a lot of the teams have their own no needle policy mm -hmm. like they're putting in effort to 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 be seen as clean whereas there are i mean that's pretty bo the nfl stat blew my mind because that's the guys who are getting caught what about the people who aren't I guess... Unless the testing is really good, which I doubt it. What the NFL set doesn't take into consideration, though, is your sample size. Like, less, uh, less people. Well, there's, there's a lot of NFL teams, and on each team there's like 50 players is or that, something. Right? There's like loads. There's absolutely loads of them. So like ultimately there's a lot more people that they're testing. Mm. Whereas in the Tour de France there's like, what, 120 riders. But I guess there's more pro riders than that. There's 1,696 NFL players as, as of 2011. So that might be an old stat. It'll be the same sort of thing. Yeah, it must be about the same. Um, there's still a lot of offences. Oh, no, of course That's it huge. is. That's huge. It is. Percentage, if they are individual cases, mm. they might be the same people reoffending. Same, same one. Person. Probably not that. He's <laughs> <It's, it's> so <laughs> strong, man. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, I, I think... I think it, it yeah. does feel like because there's an agenda in cycling that everyone's a dopehead, mm -hmm. that whenever anything happens, it gets like mainstream press. Yeah. And because... Whereas this, people don't care. I've, I guess people are taking a similar stance to me about pro cycling. Like, I don't care. I watch it. I watch it anyway. People into NFL, they care even less. They're just like, oh no. Well, it's not the same thing, doesn't it? What people. It comes down to. to down, it, like whether people are doing drugs or illegal things for that sport that mean that they're actually putting themselves at risk. As in themselves like, or other people because it's like they run into each other really fast. 
well any Both. any of it ultimately yeah. you know like if 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 drugs are legal you would it would be like the gladiator days from 2000 years ago where people would be like dying every single game my brain went to the tv show gladiator i was like God, they made that all that time again. <laughs> well they were definitely juice that's back on <laughs> um but like ultimately like if 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 there weren't restrictions people would be dying like regularly yeah because yeah, people yeah. would be want, wanting that million pound pay. Well, that's uh, the, the um, we had a lot of comments on the last, pod, last podcast, it, a lot of comments, a handful of people like, why don't they just let people go crazy and just have no doping restrictions whatsoever and the sport would be crazy and people would take, run 50 mile an hour and can jump really far. And you rightly pointed out off when we weren't recording, people would die. Yeah. Because they'd be, People would just go extreme. Well, like Marco Pantani is such an amazing like we because we what we know about Marco Pantani is his blood was so thick from all of the the drugs he was taking he legitimately had to get up a couple of times in the night to ride a bike to ride yeah, yeah to yeah, keep yeah, his heart yeah. moving yeah like yeah if he if if one night he didn't he's dead viscous blood like that's why there's regulations um, nice but it would kind of be cool wouldn't it <laughs> like you know like the actual gladiators of old like you know obviously it was brutal but i bet it was excited <laughs> what were they doping with well they probably weren't doping but the point is you know if people lost limbs it was just it, part, it was just part, part of it yeah it's part of it it, it was it, there was it wasn't a case of oh we better keep these people safe and give them a a, a shield did you ever watch spartacus blood and sand no i didn't you should great tv show there we go. Shimano sales are down 18% and profits down 40%. I said that in such a positive way. I feel bad. <laughs> Poor Shimano. Um, the comments online under this article were filled with people saying it's because everything is so expensive. Is this another case of the whole industry suffering? Are prices to blame? Um, it does feel like group sets. It does feel like Shimano and SRAM and Campag top group sets are just like offensively expensive. Top group sets are. Like top group sets are. Like offensively expensive. SRAM went up in price, didn't it? They released the new... Well, everything has. Yeah. <laughs> they released the new Apex and it has bumped the price of Rival up. Yeah. So that does happen. Not in line, well, in line with inflation, but more so. Yeah. It exceeds inflation. However, particularly with Shimano, I guess only with Shimano, because SRAM don't make a, a cheaper group sets, um, the the quality of the lower end group sets are so, so good. So people are... You, your, your 105 from a few years ago has moved up the rungs and there's been replaced by, yes, to get the same performance and pay the same money or potentially less money, you can now buy Tiagra. Less speeds, I suppose. Mm -hmm. But the actual functionality and how 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 good it is is matches the old old 105. Yeah. If, um, if and I think I think people underestimate. I know I've said this before. People underestimate how good those lower end group sets are, and maybe are hesitant to even consider them, or don't think they should be even considering them because I used to ride 105. I should still be able to ride 105. But the fact is, it's become even higher end. And if you want a matching matching performance group set, you can go one lower. And it is certainly not a bad group set. It's a their their quality. Even Claris. Yeah, it's not you haven't got very many speeds, less gears, but it has reach adjustment, the levers are really ergonomic, it's light, it's really good. Really good. Does it uh say anything about the industry as a whole i would expect shimano sales to be down because i expect everyone's sales to be down uh profits are down 40 percent, which suggests that they are still profitable and they're an unbelievably huge business so they're definitely not that bothered is this across fishing and stuff i don't well? think so i think it'll be this like, is cycling yeah, yeah. The, that's the th like as we know the other parts of shimano are actually massive um so like Shimano as a business are going to be not bothered in the slightest. They've probably even released the information. Oh, well, to be fair, they'll be they'll be publicly traded somewhere or other, so the information will be out because of that. But ultimately, 
I don't know, maybe it gives them a bit more like sway with bike brands to go, oh, but we're struggling, even though they know they're not struggling because they're still making hundreds of millions of us. Now on to our big question of the day. Big, 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 big. Cycling burnout. What was that? <laughs> the intro. Is yes, going to be intro every time. Big, 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 big. Oh, you sound like a droid. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> a small one. That's how uh, that's how tall the droid big, is big, 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 for the big, video big. viewers. Is cycling burnout real? And if so, how do you avoid it? Is cycling burnout? Well, cycling burnout is a form of hobby burnout, which is a real thing. <laughs> okay. According to psychologists, which is where hobbies start to feel like a chore. Is this a fact? A rare fact? A rare fact. <laughs> Producer Emily comes up with a fact sometimes. Symptoms include lack of enthusiasm or motivation, exhaustion, cynicism, and detachment. He's a describing Jimmy. <laughs> How does it happen? According to experts, overexposure to the hobby unattainable expectations, perfectionism, comparison, not letting the dopamine hit, not getting the dopamine hit you got at the beginning. This sounds like what I experienced when I was bike racing. It, yeah, it's definitely a thing. And I feel, I feel like a lot of people are going through it or have been through it. Mm -hmm. it's definitely like the people I used to ride with a lot, like five years ago, like hardly anyone rides anymore. And, and you know there are sometimes. I think that's a natural like... thing that happens with hobbies, though, because you do stuff. Do, do, do most people? I personally, I like doing something, seeing how good I can get at it, or just enjoy doing it, and then find other things, and then get obsessed with that for a bit, and then do that. At the moment, it's Zelda, and then I'll probably start cycling. Like I did a lot of cycling at the start of this or at the end of last year. I did cycle across America, and I'm like, well, I don't want to carry on cycling now. I want to do some other stuff in between. But that's a healthy decision. That that wasn't burnout exactly. So, so then, what you're telling me is you haven't got cycling burnout at the moment. Yes. But however, I think I have experienced it when I was racing for yeah. sure. Then it did feel like a job. It did. I I feel that like there's certain life events that mean that people do their hobbies less. Less. Like mm -hmm. the obvious one is having children. One reason why I never want to have them. I don't want to not do the things I want to do. Like, I see that a lot, you know, like I, I used to have a crew of uh, mates that used to ride in Edinburgh and I, like practically none of them ride at all anymore. Mm -hmm. But a lot of them have had kids, got promotions and they're focused on other things and therefore something's had to take, take a hit and it's been their hobby. Um, but then there are also definitely people where they just don't really... Yeah, it, we're almost where like psych there was a point wasn't there where cycling was just like a lot of people ident or a lot of people i used to hang around with very much identified as cyclists and now some of them don't ride either at all or very often because they just just don't want to mm -hmm. and a normal it well someone that doesn't fall into that with out of doubt is Chris Hall. Chris, I was going to say. Can you imagine Chris? He just loves riding. Can you imagine he really him loves riding. not riding 10,000 miles a year? No. Ever. Ever. I just can't. No. I just he's, can't he is like, he's found his thing. Yeah. And he, The only thing yeah. that stops Chris from riding is injury. Well, he's like, oh, I'm injured. Well, no, he'll still ride. He'll find a way. Well, he'll still ride. On a TT bike, on a turbo. So he can lean down. Yeah, 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 yeah. He'll, he'll always find a way. Mm. I think I've gone through some phases, but definitely off the back of my like racing phase as well, similar to yours. Yeah. Like I remember I like I sold most of my bikes, I got rid of all of my data, and I was just like I just didn't want to do it anymore. Um So many people are in that boat though, aren't they? With racing. It becomes you you basic you you aside from being able to do it full time, people treat it like they are pros. Yeah, that or it exactly escalates like, to that point yeah. very quickly. Because you want to be the best. And that's what coaches encourage mm -hmm. as well. Is that healthy for most people? Probably not. Was it healthy for anyone? Not really. Well, it makes you fit. So physically healthy. Yeah, but but it, it's... In it, some senses. The healthy part of fit is nowhere near that, that far. Mm. It's like way less than... Way that. less. You know, like, for example, putting 5K running into it. Like, if you can, like... Running a 5k in under 25 minutes in under heart, like you know, 21 to 30 minutes means that you are healthy. Mm -hmm. Whereas if I start, well, running, it's only to, yeah, of course. If, if I'm running 5k's again, 
in my head and be like, I've got to get myself back under 20. To for your first year. And then I'll be like, and I've got to get myself, well, I may as well get myself under 19 now. And I'll be fit. And then, yeah, yeah, yeah. and then that isn't, that's really unhealthy. <laughs> Whereas actually just, just being active is like the, the, the minimum of, of what's needed. Mm. And it doesn't really need to be any more than that. No, no, no. It's, it's moderate volume and uh, heart rate up sometimes, <laughs> a couple of times a week. And it's not spend half an hour at threshold every single, like, I, I every two days. I think one of the points is unattainable expectations. And that is exactly it, isn't it? Because mm. I was like, I was, obs I was obsessed with the idea of like being like, I wanted to be in the elite pen at a, at a running race. Mm -hmm. Um, and I was so far from where well, in the grand scheme of things, I was really far from it, but because I was so obsessed with that, I just like ran myself into the ground. Yeah. Like literally. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, but you can do it and sustain it for a little bit, but then it, it cracks you. And I think I most, burn out. most people are like that. And most people burn out. However, there's lots of people there are, there are versions of Chris who compete at elite level mm -hmm. who can just sustain that for their whole and those are the guys you see at races and you're like oh bloody hell like steve lampier is still a hitter yeah and he you know the guy I used to race with and he you know I think elite level his whole life and that's his thing and that's what he does and he enjoys it and you just, you just carry on being at that level for as long as you possibly can and that's their thing i think job has got a really good james job he's got a really good he's got good balance, balance. really good balance. good balance uh which i never had <laughs> yeah. um is hobby burnout a thing? Yes, without a doubt. Yeah, yeah. Um, Most people need to take cycling less seriously and enjoy themselves. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, Francis, have you got any ideas on how you would avoid cycling burnout? Not only do I have ideas, I have backed up with science. Fact. Things you should do. Oh my goodness. Stop comparing yourself to others in real life or on social media. People like Chris get put on a pedestal and that isn't 99% of people. But as I say, even in, in real life, I'd be turning up to race and I'm like, oh, those guys, they're like, they're, they have this, it's sustainable for them. So why isn't it for me? And then you carry on, you dig yourself into a hole. Try mixing it up. Different types of cycling, different manageable goals, different rides. That was definitely a thing I experienced with. I started mountain biking, did a load of mountain biking for like last year. I was just really enjoying it. And then you move on to other stuff and it, it just mix it up. Mm -hmm. take the pressure off you're not a pro unless you are a pro you don't have to train to a schedule or at all it's a pro who watch this yeah like two and then he's gonna like what if Teo's listening to this and he's like I'm not a pro ah! and then he gets in his head and I'm, like, I'm good and I'm not a pro <laughs> oh great <laughs> my favourite bit of the podcast overrated or underrated I'm gonna read out a list of stuff you're gonna tell me if they're overrated or underrated and the first one Lycra. Let me preface this by saying Jimmy runs a cycling kit brand where a lot of the products are made of Lycra. But well, I feel like you're torn. Um, what? What is Lycra specifically? Like what the... Well, it's a brand. Is it? Yeah. Is it like Hoover? Hoover. Yeah, basically. Like, yeah, I guess. It, it refers to <clears throat> elastic based fabrics okay for stretchy fabrics in multiple directions is most cycling kit not lycra probably yeah well actually a lot of it's made in china so definitely not okay. definitely not lycra. Okay. is it overrated or underrated um for cycling in general it would be overrated for road cycling it's appropriately rated mm -hmm. for bib shorts it's still underrated and the reason for that is a bib short is as comfortable as your pad is so in the right same side. place. Yeah. Got you. you don't want things rubbing and therefore a spandex or lycra or whatever you want to call it holds it in place nice and snug. Mm -hmm. uh, for general cycling, it's overrated. Fair enough. Power meters. Overrated. Overrated. Like unbelievably overrated. Unless you're trading. It depends on your goals. If you're in the small percentage of people who really want to excel in performance on the bike, a power meter is like you're cooking with gas. Whereas if you're running just a heart rate monitor, it's harder work. The longer you do, the longer you've been cycling for and the more you've learned to 
feel and perceive effort, the more you can get away with not having a power meter. But most of those people who train with perceived effort really well have probably used power in the past. What about... Strictly from a training perspective. What about sports that don't have power meters? They have other... Well, they just do what they can. Less accurately than in cycling. It's, it's, a, it's amazing that cycling has such a great way of measuring effort. What does running use? Nothing. Pace. All oh, right. Cadence? You, you have a cadence? Running cadence? Yeah, but it would, be, it would effectively be fixed. Yeah. It's, it would all be based around heart rate. Yeah. And it's more technique-based, I suppose, right? And, and perceived effort. Perceived, perceived effort. Perceived effort is so important. Per, the perceived effort should be on this list. Underrated. Yeah. And really good. Yeah. Really good. And, and I think it's important even with power, because the, in, one of the reasons I don't like power mm -hmm. is it can encourage people to do more than they should be doing. And that's what it can also effort. stop people from doing more than they should be doing. Oh yeah, I can. I think it's a great tool that just needs to be for you, you. Your introduction to it needs to be correct, and someone who knows what they're talking about should show you how to use it and what numbers mean. Like it's pretty. It's it's uh, it's you're shooting in the dark unless you do a proper lactate test or at least a twenty minute test that's done correctly before you start using a power meter. And most people like people have the Zwift one, don't they? People are getting more into it, but ideally you want, uh, you prick your finger, check your lactate, I don't, correct test. You're gonna, you're gonna get like 100,000 people going out and getting bloody blood samples now. <laughs> the, which the, makes the point people is, take it too seriously, which we just talked about. It, it, ultimately, it's a good tool for some people. If you can afford it, why not? But, yeah. It is completely and utterly unnecessary, and for nearly everyone, it's just pointless. Amonique Van Vluten. She is the winner of the first edition of the Tour de France Femme Avec Swift. Some people probably won't know who she is, and that says to me she is underrated. underrated. I agree. I agree. What's a, do, do you want to, what do they call it? Palmares or something like that. <laughs> is, that do they, is that a thing? <laughs> is it the longest list of Palmares ever? <laughs> it's just every race ever. Probably. Yeah. <laughs> She's dominated women's cycling for the past few years. Uh, hard as nails. I, I'm pretty certain she like basically trains with like male professionals and just like isn't, it is at the same standard as like male professionals um she, she's just she's an absolute monster she's like one of those people that are like she's like chris hall obsessed with cycling mm -hmm. but like way better yeah <laughs> <laughs> yes. Sorry, <Chris>. <laughs> she's won all three women's cycling grand tour equivalents she's won six women's grand tours in a row she won the giro donnet in 2017 18 19 22 23 inaugural tour de france fam in 2022 Welter Femenina in 2021, 22, 23, and the road racing world champs at least twice. She's 40 and she's retiring soon. Isn't it? Great career. Quit while you're ahead. Done. Isn't it interesting, though, that uh, the bulk of that is the latter end of her career? So late mm -hmm. 30s, mm -hmm. mid to late 30s. Mm -hmm. I wonder which, when she got into her. I think that's right. actually quite consistent with um, re like endurance. So. Uh, I remember doing some reading a long time ago on ultra, female ultra runners, mm -hmm. and they typically peak late 30s, yeah, yeah, yeah. which for men is typically like late 20s, early 30s. But ultra running is still. Ultra running, yeah. yeah. Interesting. Um, so that's interesting as well, that a lot of that like big like domination has come at the end of her career. I, I think... Great climber, great, great everything. Like, she's just a beast. Envy. Perf. Over races. Looks cool. It looks very cool. Looks really cool. It's very expensive. Very expensive. I don't particularly like the stems and bars. They have those weird ends on. Like the clip around. I I always wanted... Wheels very cool. I'm, see, I've never really liked the wheels. I, I always wanted an MV bar stem seat post. Were you around... Were you cycling when they were called Edge? Edge. The wheels were called Edge. Yeah, the brand was called Edge. They still exist, Edge, don't they? No. Oh, so Edge, so Envy Wheels become... Edge, yeah. But that must be quite recent then. 
because I've definitely seen it. Nah, that was a while ago. Edge composites was changed to Envy composites. Probably some sort of uh, copyright thing. When did that happen? That was 2010. Oh, weird. Mm-hmm. I'm a couple of guys. There was a guy in a cycling club years ago who had a set of Edge wheels, and they were. It was so cool. Post pictures on forums. I feel like Envy is for people that would buy a Rolex. What? What does that mean? Flashy. (laughs) Flashy. It's just like flashy. It's no better than like a cheap one. Burry looks cool. (laughs) I'm sure it's slightly better than a cheap one, but marginally for the average person. Yeah, but like, you know, like say one of their stems is like 400 quid. Mm -hmm. If you bought a hundred quid stem, which is still a lot of money... It's going to be as good, really. The stem. Got it's going to be stem. fine. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, overrated. Overrated. I love I, overrated, but not... Yeah, I, I, I love yeah, it. Yeah, I, really cool. If, if I had the money, if, I'd buy one. But it is overrated, if it, but that's fine. If, you, if you, I could deck my bike over 100 quid, I would have all of my <laughs> bikes decked out with Envy, but I can't, so, yeah, not interested. Graham Obrey. Underrated. Underrated. Coolest I bike so, with all time. Do enough people know who he is? And I think no. Definitely not. However, the, even like even though there was a movie made about his life and all that stuff, um, for people who don't know, he had the hour record in it and got it in a really unconventional position on the bike. More he had than the Superman position. And then, yeah, they kept bringing out rules to try and... He's a Scottish guy. Um, he just did things his own way. And that really ruffled the uh, governing body's feathers and... They kept trying to stop him from winning stuff by changing the rules. And it's if, he, he had the Superman position. That was there, right. There was two positions. There was and then he had the the first one which he did was the Superman. So like arms straight, straight out. Straight out. The second one when they banned that was he brought his arms right underneath him. Yeah. So it was a position where like his arms are fully bent under his body. They're fully tucked in. It's crazy it's, looking, it's isn't it? Basically, crazy. like if you took. A modern TT position, mm. it's the, ex- the both extremes. Mm-hmm. The one where it's fully long and the one where it's fully closed. And in both cases, he was just like destroying stuff. And at the time, he was like, it was him and Chris Boardman that were constantly battling for these, for these records. And for whatever reason, it does feel like the people in the powers wanted Boardman <laughs> to, to have the records. Because every time Obrey smashed it to bits, bearing in mind he literally built one of his bikes. He, so he was building his bikes himself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was dismantling was it like a dishwasher washing or washing machine. Because <laughs> he, he was like, well, if it can spin that well, then it's going to have good. It's got some. It's got a good bearing. So then he was like okay. dismantling bits of his washing machines and building bikes and breaking records against Boardman when he was on like the Lotus bike, which I'm sure you've seen images mm-hmm, of. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. They're like probably cost like two hundred thousand. Yeah, he's on this thing made of it. Made oh, watch machine, watch machine. Where he's just had this genius himself. He is, a, he is honestly, I, I think he's one of those people that's like, he's a modern day like Einstein, but like because of how capitalist we are now, he just kind of gets pushed away because they don't like the look of him. They don't like, the, they don't, they don't like his vibe. So they're kind of like pushing him away, but I think he's amazing. He also then went on to... I think he the, one of his documentaries that he's in. I actually met him as part of this documentary. Was for he was trying to set a bicycle powered land speed record, and it was like one of those like torpedo prone things. And he had like different ways of like thinking about it. And yeah, I, I just think he's incredible. He's yeah. so, like he, he's like a naturally gifted engineer that has had many struggles in his life and has gone through a hell of a journey. I just think he's the brilliant. move that. I would recommend watching a film. I think it's called The Flying Scotsman. Yeah. Brilliant film. And not what you expect. There's a mind blowing. Yeah. Underrated. Graham Obrey. I'm assuming you're choosing underrated. Oh yeah, obviously underrated. Uh, and oh, the the one, the other film that he's been in is Battle Mountain, which is wicked. What's that? That's the one where he does the land. Uh, oh, the thing you yeah, met. Yeah, he goes for the, the land speed record. Why did you meet him? Uh, I went to the premiere of Battle Man- Mountain. Uh, Emily was legit press at the time so got us an invite to it and then I got to I stood on there's a photo of me arm in arm with Graham O'Brien with then this this like prone position bike torpedo thing that he built in the film he actually talks about when he got a professional contract on a French team because he like it's it's he was fu- like so fast. It's, Surely he would be picked up by a pro team but he never well he, well, he, never he was he was so he actually did get a contract with a French team 
And on the day one he went out to France, day one of this new contract, they sat, it, sat him down and gave him the talk about doping because it was the point where everyone was doping and he, he literally walked away. He quit his, the, the, his best chance of being a professional cyclist and he walked away from it because they said, there's, you know, you've got to dope. Next up, fluff up of the week. Fluff of the week. You know what the fluff up is? What we didn't up? have one at the start of this episode, but now I've realized it's the street sweeper thing that comes past <laughs> every five minutes and goes, which I don't know if you're hearing the audio of this podcast, but it's really, really annoying. So to take it to another level, so actually what the fluff up of the year is, is you deciding you want this studio, which has the worst quality audio in, in the world, part of it. In the world. In the world. <laughs> We're committed to it now. <laughs> Even this room, it goes... Throw one of this one million black squares. Next up, listeners take over, and we have a question from Michael. I live in Seattle, and I've been trying to figure out a winter bike situ situation. Where's Seattle? It's in America, Francis. I know it's in America. I want to see where it is on a on a map. I'm gonna. Guess I think it's Central East. That's my guess. It's not. It's where I thought it was, which is above Oregon. It's in Washington, nearly Canada. Wow. Yeah, near. Surrey, Vancouver. Well, it's not actually near, but there's a there's a Surrey near Vancouver. <laughs> maps, amazing, You're right? Back to the <laughs> I live in Seattle. Have you seen maps? Uh, where <laughs> they are. Have you ever looked at a map? No, never. Yes, yeah, yeah, I yeah. probably should. I found out about them in Zelda, <laughs> and then I realised there's real life ones as well. <laughs> Google Maps. Do you uh, do you have any recommendations? That's your first experience of a map, isn't it? Google, yeah, yeah. Google invented maps. <laughs> The first ever map Google. made by Google. <laughs> Do you have any recommendations for a winter bike or winter sizing, winterizing a bike? Yeah, easy. Mud guards. Mud guards, disc brakes, if you can. Che cheap parts. And because it wears out your stuff. Yeah, so there is going to be. I mean, do you follow Dustin Klein? YouTube. YouTube man. I don't watch YouTube. Ah, oh, at all. <laughs> you really don't. Dustin Klein lives in uh, Portland, Oregon. Oregon? Oregon? Oregon. Aragon. Near, not that far, not as far north, so his weather's probably not as bad. It rains a lot there in winter and snows. I would recommend mud guards, full ones that go all the way around, not just the ones that stick out. Like, that's great if you're just getting caught in showers and you want to protect yourself. But if you have mud guards that go all the way around your wheels, and have the bit that goes behind your, like, you, near your BB, mm -hmm. that will stop all of your bike getting covered in shit. And, and you. Getting, and you. Um, so it will last longer. Cheap parts, for sure, because they're going to wear out. There's always more wear and tear. Um, we have a lot of rain. That's the, that's the main thing, really. Mud, mud, honestly, mud guards are like... Cheap parts, you're not fussed about them getting messed up? The elite, the, the elitism thing in cycling goes like, oh, mud guards are ugly and horrible. I don't care. They're amazing. Oh, yeah. They're so good. Yeah, yeah. Big time. All winter bikes should have mud guards on them. Big time. It makes a big difference. It makes a... I mean, you, do, you won't have to clean it as much. It really does make a huge difference. Yeah. Um, other than that, like frame and stuff, you're not going to wear out. You can still ride your frame, your yeah. nice frame. It's just a few adjustments you can make to your existing bike, which make it more suitable. That marks the end of the Wild Ones podcast this week. If you have any questions or stories, please send it to wildonespodcast at cademedia.co.uk. That's all for this episode. Please subscribe if you're on YouTube. Please give us a review and a follow if you are listening. And thank you for watching. <laughs> listening. Thank you for listening to our voices. <laughs>